Hi, my name is Sue Schmidt. I'm the Nanslo CHEO Project Coordinator working for WICHE. And today we are holding our first professional development workshop for faculty. And um, I said workshop, but I meant webinar, sorry, for faculty. And we're very excited today to have Kimi Jonah as our speaker. He is going to speak on remote online labs, a new model for teaching and learning scientific practices. Uh, Kimi is the research professor of learning sciences and computer science at Northwestern University. And he is also director of the Office of STEM Education Partnerships. A little background on Kimi. Um, Kimi is the lead research and development project. Uh, he, sorry, leads research and development projects in STEM curriculum design, cyber learning, online and blended learning models, and new game-based approaches to engaging youth in STEM. I was very excited to um, look at his background because he's done great work in relationship to remote web-based lab opportunities. So. Um, Kimi helps coordinate those, helps with the building of the curriculum, and uh, providing access to students. And uh, Kimi, did you want to mention anything else in relationship to that and your background? Um, I can't when I get started. I think you've covered a pretty good chunk of it, though. Perfect. Thank you. And the last thing I wanted to note was that this webinar is funded by the U.S. Department of Labor. And we are very fortunate that through the CHEO funding, we are able to put on these webinars for professional development. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Kimi. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, certainly a pleasure for me to be here and to join you all um, on the webinar. Um, I'm going to switch over and try to share my desktop here. You guys, can everyone see the slides now? Uh, Kimi, I can see them. Okay. Well, that, that, I'll take that as a yes then. Um, so again, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, hear about the work that uh, Nanslo and Wichi are doing in remote labs. And I'm really happy to be able to share the work that we've done here at Northwestern, um, uh, really thinking about how to make remote labs a core part of a uh, learning experience for students, um, uh, primarily at the high school level, but really um, broadly speaking across uh, all educational settings. So um, this uh, covers a lot of what Sue said earlier, but um, I've been very involved in uh, higher education and online learning in particular. Uh, even before I came to Northwestern, I uh, helped uh, so, uh, Carnegie Mellon set up some new online master's programs in Silicon Valley. Those were primarily around software engineering as opposed to um, uh, core sort of uh, sciences as we know them. Um, and I also advise um, a range of businesses and schools and other universities on blended and online learning technologies as well. So again, uh, I think Sue covered most of those things. So to get started, um, I just want to um, kind of have us think about what it means to teach and to learn uh, science and engineering, uh, generally speaking. Um, and I'm sharing here the uh, eight or so scientific practices that come out of the next generation science standards. And again, even though you may not be working in the K-12 arena, um, you know, these are fairly um, recognizable uh, practices, I think, um, you know, at all uh, grade levels and all um, education levels in terms of what we think about when we want to engage uh, our learners in uh, science and engineering practices. Um, and so again, you know, these are the kinds of things that you really need to learn by doing them. You can't just learn about them. And so having our students memorize the uh, you know, eight, five steps of the inquiry cycle or whatever really is fairly meaningless when we want to get them to think scientifically and to um, at least understand what the process is like. And so um, these are the kinds of things that I think uh, laboratory science 
courses in general um, are, are can be very good at, at supporting, although there are a number of limitations. And I think remote labs, uh, as an emerging technology, can also do an excellent job of helping students engage in many, if not all, uh, of these uh, scientific practices that we uh, are targeting for them. Um, so. Again, without knowing too much about uh, the people on the call and, and your experience with remote labs, um, what I hope to do today is walk through kind of some of the high level questions about remote labs uh, to give you a, kind of a, a big picture sense of them. And then we're going to dive a little bit deeper and look at uh, a few examples of remote labs that uh, I'm working on here in my lab. Uh, and at Northwestern, um, as well as some of the research studies that we've done to try to understand uh, if remote labs are effective, are they scalable, um, you know, how do they compare as a learning uh, tool to other kinds of online resources like simulations, uh, for example. Uh, so we're really trying not just to build remote labs uh, and understand how to do that better, but understand uh, what they mean for learning and how students interact with them effectively. So, um, you know, again, as we go through, um, I think we have still a fairly small enough group here where, you know, it would be um, really uh, interesting and a lot more interactive, I think, um, you know, to field any questions you have or clarifications. So please um, either chat them in the chat window, which I can't see, although Sue will interrupt me uh, with them, or, um, you know, raise your hands. Because again, when I'm in my PowerPoint mode here. I can't see um, a lot of the other interfaces there uh, for the uh, webinar. So uh, let's start um, by looking at um, some of the labs that we have uh, on uh, our site, which is ilabcentral.org. And the first one I want to share with you, and again, I think this is useful because uh, for those of you who haven't interacted with them, it's sometimes hard to understand what exactly they are. Um, this first one is. Um, uh, a lab which is a Geiger counter that is uh, housed in the University of Queensland in Australia. And the point of this lab is to allow students to measure the effects of uh, distance on radiation. And uh, you can see on the left side here that you get to actually input your parameters for the experiment in terms of distances, measurement time, number of trials. And then on the right side is an online lab journal where the students can get prompted to kind of communicate what they're thinking, what the rationale is for the design, and whatnot. And so what it does is uh, the interface sends the students' experimental parameters over to this remote device sitting in Australia, uh, right outside of Brisbane, Australia. And it actually uh, queues it up in a queue. Uh, and then whenever uh, you get to the front of the queue, it picks your experiment off of the queue and sends it to the device. And you can see the Geiger counter tube there on the left side uh, moving up and down. It will be a little choppier for you on a screen share than it is for me, but you get the basic idea. Um, and so the student can actually watch the lab running on a webcam, um, which is pretty exciting the first time, but then less so you know, in subsequent times. And uh, you can see that it will tell you about how long until your results are done. And in the meantime, there's some other questions on the right side here that uh, you're prompted to, uh, to answer. And again, this is part of our sort of metacognition effort to really get the students to think about what they're doing and to write down and share with you, the instructor, um, what, what it is that they're thinking as they go through this process to sort of externalize it. It's kind of like what you would do if you were wandering around a physical lab and engaging students in a sort of Q&A around what they were doing, why they were doing it. And again, with the uh, remote uh, yeah, aspect to it, we have to replace that with a different modality. And so this online lab journal on the right side is a way that we do that for students to get them to be sort of thoughtful about that. And so then um, at the very end, what ends up happening as uh, you get your results back, for some reason it stopped here, so I'm not really sure why that is. Um, you get your results back, um, and then uh, you get to analyze them uh, on a graph. And at the very end of the process, what happens is um, uh, the lab journal that we have on the right side gets saved as a PDF. And then the student can either upload it to a Blackboard site, um, print it out, and, and turn it in if it was a paper-based version, which uh, often happens in some classrooms. 
and then uh, or just email it into the instructor as their uh, you know as their final uh, input for their lab journal. Let me just stop here for one second and ask if there's any questions about uh, this particular example. We're going to look at another one, which will show you some more of those pieces. But this was a nice, simple example to start with. I'm going to switch back over to the uh, to the chat window. All right. Well, I don't see any uh, any hands or any. Questions, so we'll just keep on going. But please do um, interrupt with questions if you have any. So another lab that we're working on now, just to give you another example, um, is an X-ray powder diffraction lab that's based here at Northwestern University, and it's used to allow students practice in identifying sort of unknown crystalline materials. So if you have some kind of substance. And you're not exactly sure what's in it. You can use this device to characterize uh, what the uh, molecular components are, and you can also use it in other applications to see how pure a particular sample is. So it's a good uh, exercise in learning about some chemical uh, concepts around crystalline structure, as well as some physics concepts around diffraction. Um, so I'm going to switch over. We're going to do this demo live. Um, and uh, I'll walk you through some of those uh, same uh, pieces that you saw before. So here's the same basic interface that you saw before, same lab journal on the right side. Uh, opportunity for students to click and ask different questions about what is crystallography, um, uh, what is uh, Bragg's law and diffraction. Those open up different readings, either PDFs or uh, web pages. Um, and then when they move on, um, they again get the same sets of prompts or similar sets of prompts to you saw before. I'm not going to try to type and talk at the same time because I know that I'm notoriously bad at that. So I'm just going to pretend to be typing in here. Um, at each stage, uh, we have uh, uh, opportunity to let the student know that they're not going to be able to go back and change their answers. So here, what you'll see on the left side, and I know there's a little bit of lag when I do screen sharing, so hopefully this will catch up by the time I finish talking, is again a, a slightly different interface because again this device has different control parameters to it. But again, you should feel like this is something you've seen before after seeing the Geiger counter example earlier. And one of our goals is to make the user experience for students as consistent and as easy uh, as possible, as opposed to having to learn brand new uh, software each and every time that they get to a new piece of equipment. So I think that's one of the advantages that remote labs have if they're done well and thoughtfully. Is um, you can get rid of a lot of the learning curve associated with the uh, software and just really allow the students to focus on. Uh, the learning goals you have for that particular lab. Um, and so in this case, um, let me just switch over. Here's a live webcam view of the uh, equipment. It's actually sitting about 200 yards from my building and another building on Northwestern's campus. And you can see this, um, this arm will pivot to different angles to kind of pick up the x-rays that are getting beamed through our sample. And so when I need to um, design my experiment, I need to tell the machine what angles I want to, um, to have it uh, go through to uh, pick up the potential uh, diffraction. So I'm going to pick a few that will just make it go fairly quickly here. Let's go from, say, 65 to 85 degrees uh, with a step size of 1 degree. And uh, just for time's sake, this may not be really smart, but we'll just do one second per per increment to collect data on. Um, and then uh, once I fill out my prompt around uh, why I chose these particular uh, settings, um, again, it will send my uh, lab over to the device. And since no one else is using it, um, I know I'll be first in the queue. Hey, I am. I'm first in the queue. Tells, it guesses about how long it will take. Um, and then uh, what will happen is um, it will send it over to the uh, equipment. And uh, let me just make sure that uh, this is still really live here. Let's see. 
There you go. So, oh, sorry. Anyway, go um, you're doing that. There was a question. What software are you using for the interface? Um, well, people can watch it moving while we're talking, so I think that's a perfect time to answer some questions. You can see it moving through the experiment. But the software on the web page that uh, we're using here is based off of Flash, um, and so that gives it a nice, clean interface for students. However, it does limit the use on mobile devices, particularly Apple devices. And so we're in the process of redoing the interface to make it uh, more mobile friendly right now. Perfect. Why he is loading that. Do others have questions as well? Um, one person noted that it's a very nice interface. So if anyone would like to ask a question, you can also select the talk button or for those who have joined on the phone, you can use your phone, just um, uh, unmute your speaker and ask the question. Well, Sue, uh, if anything pops up, please um, please do interrupt me. I'll, I'll keep going, um, but I do welcome questions as we go through. Um, and I, I want to be sure not to go through it too quickly so people can get a good feel for it. So. Um, Again, you can see on the left side now that our results are back. And so um, this is kind of what it looks like uh, on some of the steps we didn't get to see previously, but it looks very similar. And so um, all my data that came back um, is shown here. So I can see the actual data that came back from the real device um, and uh, the, the various angles that it was collected at. If I want, I can uh, export these uh, this file so I can uh, analyze it in Excel or other software. If that's one of the goals the instructor has is to use uh, do the analysis by hand. That's accommodated here. Um, but uh, we also want it to support the ability for students to graph their data right in the tool here. And so you can see uh, in this particular case, that uh, when we got the, the data back from the uh, X-ray diffractor, um, that we have a big spike right at about 69 degrees. And if I was to continue with my analysis here and look up some of the information that was pro would be provided or do some research, I would notice that um, silicon has a characteristic spike right at about 69 degrees. And so that might be a clue in this analysis that the sample that's in there right now uh, is a sample of silicon or at least has some silicon in it. Uh, if it was a mixture, you might see spikes at other places. So I'm going to insert that graph into my lab journal, go through some of the final questions about interpreting my data um, in terms of uh, what's the relationship between angle and intensity. Um, and uh, you know, does, is my data definitive, or do I have to go back and collect more data? And so then, what I do is, uh, as I said, it downloads a uh, PDF of my lab journal with all my gibberish responses here that you can see. Uh, hopefully, a student would do a better job actually answering the questions. Um, and puts them all in a PDF. Here's my graph. Puts it in the PDF as well. Um, and then all my raw data is at the bottom as well. So. You can see all of the work that the student has done. And again, this is a, a work product that would then be uh, uploaded into a, a Blackboard or other LMS um, uh, for an assignment or uh, emailed into the instructor to, uh, to complete the lab work. So uh, that gives you a good sense of how things finish up um, at the end of that uh, interaction. Uh, One of the things that Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll stop. This is and I apologize because I hit my speaker button instead of my mute button, so I literally dropped the call for a second. So hopefully everybody could still hear you for that instant when um, we didn't have that connection because I'm the moderator on the teleconference. So sorry, guys. Um, so the one question is, so use of the machine is to measure, but all students are using the same substance to measure, or are they changing substances? That's the first question. Yeah, so that's, a, that's an excellent question. And one of the reasons I wanted to show this example was because it is an instrument that does take samples. Um, the Geiger counter takes samples too, but uh, the radioactive strontium in there doesn't uh, really decay very quickly. So 
it's not like somebody needs to be loading up new samples every time. But in this case, um, yes, it does. Uh, it does need a sample loaded up in there. And uh, yes, in, in this particular scenario, um, all the students would be analyzing the same sample. And so the emphasis clearly is not on sample preparation, but rather on the analysis part. Um, and what we do um, to accommodate that is we craft our lab materials that surround this lab to create a scenario uh, that makes it um, relevant that to be analyzing whatever that sample is. So I'll give you an example. One of the uh, pieces of curriculum that we've developed for this for high school students um, is kind of modeled after CSI. Um, and there's a, um, a hit and run accident uh, that you're helping to investigate. Uh, and some paint samples from the the bumper of the car um, were left, and, and you get to analyze those paint samples. Um, and so, uh, in that case, you know the scenario makes it clear that the sample is uh, kind of fixed in advance, and it's your job to kind of get to the bottom of um, could that paint sample have been associated with that particular car? Now, so that's kind of how we set up the scenarios here when you've got a sample loaded up into the device. Okay, and so the students themselves are unable to change the samples. Is that accurate? On this particular device, that is accurate. Um, on the Geiger counter, um, there is uh, what's called an auto sampler uh, an, or an auto loader. And in that case, the students um, have the ability to select from three different types of emitters. So there are many instruments that um, have sort of robotic loaders on them, in which case you can um, have a, a wider range of samples ready to go, and the students can select a sample from a, a range of options off of a menu. So that's kind of the way that we compromise on that. Okay, and one other question that I see on the chat room is um, how many students are using a piece of equipment at one time, and how do they share control of it if they are sharing the equipment? Yeah, that's another very excellent question. Um, and I'll get to the first part of your question in a couple of slides. But the, the model that we use and that we advocate strongly for is an asynchronous model. Um, and so you can think of the kind of the distinctions that we make when we talk about online learning, whether it's synchronous, like what we're doing now as a webinar, or asynchronous, which might say be more of a discussion board or um, self-paced course. Um, we use that model when we access labs as well. And so if you remember, when the lab gets sent over, it gets put in a queue. Um, and so that way, any number of students can be uh, using the website. Um, and then whenever they're ready to submit their lab, uh, it gets queued up in whatever order of first come, first serve. And so there's really no limit on the number of students that can be using the website at a given time. But of course, uh, as it gets busy, the queue gets longer and longer, and you may have to wait uh, for a longer period of time in order to get your results back. And so there is the, the website supports the ability for you to quit and come back um, and get your result, you know pick up right where you left off and get your results. You don't have to repeat all the earlier stages of your work. And when we have a larger number of students say in a classroom use it, we often recommend that they, uh, you know, if they want to submit it during class time, that they then log back on uh, that evening to pick up the results later on. So um, that's how we accommodate it uh, via an asynchronous model. There are some devices that you have to log on and actually control in real time. Those are the synchronous ones. And um, in that case, the system will allow you to make uh, time reservations uh, to, to get on the machine, and it literally kicks off. Uh, when your time comes up, it kicks off the other people who are using it and gives you control. But we found that that's very tricky to use, especially in high school audiences, because if you forget to log on during your reservation time, then you're kind of out of luck. Um, it works better for college students or, or graduate students who might be a little bit more responsible with their time. But there's definitely a trade-off there. And, and I believe that equipment can get utilized much more efficiently and effectively in an asynchronous mode. But you can do both. Okay. So are there any um, situations in the synchronous mode where students are collaborating together? Yes. It's certainly possible um, for students to log on at the same time um, and collaborate. So for example, 
Um, you could use the exact mechanism we're using here with, uh, you know, Illuminate um, or Collaborate, whatever they renamed it to, Blackboard Collaborate, um, to, uh, you know, screen share uh, the screen like I was doing. Um, you know, either use uh, the chat window or voice to um, discuss uh, or debate what the experimental parameter should be, um, and then submit it. You know, as group work, that's certainly um, you know very doable. But what I would say in that case is that, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later on. One of the key advantages, in my view, um, of a remote lab interface like this is that it supports a much more individualized experience in doing lab work than is typically available in a more traditional face-to-face -face lab that has lab groups of you know anywhere from two to five or six students working together. And I think that there are obviously many advantages to that arrangement, but there's also some pretty significant disadvantages, especially for students that may be more socially reserved um, uh, or shy or uncertain of their knowledge. Um, and they can often, as we all know, uh, for those of you who have taught in lab sections before, um, sometimes one or two students will kind of take over the group and leave the other students kind of in a more passive role. So this, I think, offers an opportunity for students to um, make mistakes privately and learn from those mistakes and feel comfortable in uh, engaging in a more authentic scientific experience, which is a little bit more trial and error uh, opportunity to not screw up your entire group's assignment just because uh, you you think maybe you want to try it one way or another. So um, I think there's definitely a trade-off there that's worth you know thinking about. There are some other good questions as well, and this next one you may be covering later, so just let me know. Yep. Um, have you done any studies comparing student learning with these labs versus in-person labs? Do the students still feel that they are personally collecting data? And then a follow-up to that, which kind of um, adds to it, have there been a different feedback for the synchronous versus asynchronous? And is there a faculty member to help students if he she is working? What was the last part of that last question? Um, are there faculty members that are helping if the student has a question when they're performing these experiments? Okay, so the first question I'm going to defer because the latter part of my uh, talk um, will walk through a number of experiments that we did. Um, what I will say just in advance is that um, we did not do a study that compared um, face to face and remote labs. We did one that compared simulations of remote labs. However, there are some studies out there um, that did look at all three conditions, face to face, remote, and simulation. And so um, there's definitely um, some research literature out there around that particular question. All right, thank you. I think sure. No, these are these are great questions, and uh, 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 keep them coming because I think that they're really hitting on a lot of the important issues. Yeah, uh, Gina Bennett offered that they have done such an experiment with physics classes, and apparently there was no significant difference in learning outcomes. Yeah, I, I, that that's definitely uh, consistent with the literature findings. Um, I think you know the the basic caveat is. Uh, and again, I would encourage everybody to be thoughtful about this before kind of just painting with broad brushstrokes is it all depends on what your learning goals for the lab experience are. So certainly if you are very heavily focused on um, things like sample preparation, um, learning how to use particular pieces of equipment in a hands-on mode, um, other kinds of things like that, then you know obviously, Remote labs are going to be a lot less successful at those learning goals, but if you have a different set of learning goals, um, they they may be better. So, um, you know, my rule of thumb is, you know, there's not a blanket yes or no answer for which one is better. You have to ask which one is better for what goals and which audience under what circumstances, and that's kind of a more thoughtful way of posing the question. Good point. Yeah. Um, 
sometimes you know it does get a little bit like religious warfare, and so you know it's better to try to move beyond uh, religious warfare and get into you know a more scientific uh, and data you know empirically based uh, way of looking at those questions. So, all right. Uh, these are great. Keep the questions coming, and uh, we'll move on a little bit. Um, another one, and this one speaks to one of the questions we got about the samples. Uh, another device that we're bringing online this fall is a um, a water quality analyzer, um, which does total organic carbon and nitrogen analysis. And one of the reasons um, that I think this is a timely slide is that on the left side here, you can see the auto sampler I was talking about. I'm not sure if you can see underneath this plexiglass, but there's a lot of different vials on this turntable. And so that's an example of a machine where you can have, you know, dozens and dozens of samples all loaded up um, and then can be, you know, pick, you can pick and choose which samples you're looking at uh, remotely. So there's one where that's a, exactly the kind of setup that is becoming much more common these days um, in experimental devices. One other point before we move on is um, the two examples that I showed, the Geiger counter and the X-ray diffractometer, are also examples of two different categories of remote labs. The first one, the Geiger counter, was really developed to be purely accessed online. There is no way to use that piece of equipment as it's set up in a hands-on, face-to-face modality. It was custom developed purely for remote access. The X-ray diffractometer falls into, I think, a more common category right now, at least, which is it's a, a piece of equipment that's sitting in an active lab here at Northwestern, and it's still being used in a face-to-face, hands-on modality, but also we want to make it available remotely. So it has to be switched back and forth between uh, researchers here, grad students, and faculty who want to use it uh, in a traditional way with uh, the you know the way that we used it just now, which is a remote way, and so um, those are both important distinctions because obviously when you get into a shared environment where it has to be switched back and forth, you have to deal with a lot more complexity in terms of um, how do you switch it over, what hours, um, you know, will it be available remotely, how do you communicate that to the remote users who don't know exactly what the schedule is. Um, how do you be sure that the right sample is loaded up? So there's a whole host of sort of more policy and human resources questions that you have to deal with as well. But I share those all in the vein of um, kind of encouraging you that it can be done, uh, and you know you work closely with the lab manager, and you can find ways uh, to make it work out uh, as well. So. I just wanted to call your attention to the kind of the two different categories of examples that I showed there as well. So, and we can talk more. If there's any questions about that, we can always talk more about that later. Yeah, I just have a question. Is there some type of scheduling software that you were using so you can flip it back and forth, or is it just a, you know a notice out to everybody that it's not available at this point in time? Well, right now it has to manually be uh, switched over to remote access. Um, so the lab manager actually has to go over to the uh, machine and, and flip a switch. Um, the interface that we'll have, which isn't quite finished yet that we looked at, will tell the users once we have it kind of set up in the right way that, so for example, that uh, the machine is available for remote use, say, after 5 p.m. on weekdays and uh, you know all day Sunday or something like that. Um, and so they'll know when they can expect it to be available. However, that doesn't mean that they can't submit their labs. And so uh, even when it might not be immediately available, students can still submit their, their labs. It's just that it will sit in the queue uh, until 5 o'clock or whenever when the machine gets switched on, and at which point it will start processing it. So from a student point of view, as long as they know, um, you know when, what the schedule is and about how long it will be till the results are done, um, they can continue to you know, access the interface um, at any time. All right, so let's uh, let's ask a couple more questions about remote labs. Um, again, as you all begin to think about uh, or have thought about how to deploy some of these in the application areas that you're looking at, you know, one of the big questions is, are they scalable? So let's look at some of the data that we've collected um, over the last uh, about 40 years for the Geiger counter lab that I showed you before. So in that time, um, you know, without any sort of uh, marketing uh, effort. Uh, 
you know, we've grown from a very small, you know, number of users during our pilot test in 2009, um, fairly steadily, uh, you know, organically, to just about 8,000 user registrations on, you know, on our uh, our site. So I think that's pretty encouraging, and it you know shows that we're able to kind of keep up with with that growth. Um, in terms of actually how many experiments those users um, have run, uh, again, you can see that you know we've grown, we've climbed over over the years to somewhere around today about 11,000 uh, Geiger counter or radioactivity experiments that we've run since uh, we first started keeping track back in May of '09, um, and so uh, you know we've really racked up a, quite a number of uh, hours. If you laid those labs, you know, end to end, that's Probably a year, year and a half worth of the lab running, you know, nonstop during a regular school day. Um, so it's a lot of a lot of access that we're providing. Um, in terms of uh, you know who we're serving, uh, this is a, a slightly out of date map that shows uh, where uh, our users are coming from, and really it's a fairly global footprint. Obviously, uh, clustered much more heavily here in the U.S., but. Nonetheless, uh, we're seeing um, access from uh, lots of parts of the world, and that's really one of the really exciting things I think about um, about remote labs is the ability to serve uh, a global audience um, that would not otherwise have access, you know, to, to that equipment. Um, in terms of, you know, student access, one of the compelling arguments, in my view, is that it allows students to do the lab when they're Ready and and uh, you know mentally prepared to do that, and so um, if you look, just, I mean, again, we don't know exactly what time zone everybody's coming from when they when they show up, but if you just mapped it to Central Time uh, where we are, and often we get a lot of our users either from Central or Eastern Time, um, you can see that you know that students are using the the lab uh, you know pretty much at all hours of the day and night, obviously less so in the middle of the night, but but not zero. Um, and so it's a, it's a nice opportunity for students, you know, to uh, fire up the lab at 11:30 at night if that's when they're doing their homework uh, or first thing in the morning. So um, it's nice to be able to see that that access being actually um, used. Hey, Timmy, on that um, time scale, is that reflected in your time compared to when they come in? So if they were in India, is it just converting it? So you see it here, or is it? Yeah, no. This is just mapped into Central Time, so it doesn't reflect the local time that the users are doing it because um, we would have to really rerun the data on that. But that would be an interesting thing to do too, to see what the local time was. Um, it's a little bit tricky because mapping an IP number to a geographic location sometimes is a little bit of a fuzzy exercise. But no, this is just um, you know. Mapped into Central Time. Okay. Not, not users' time. All right, great. I'm getting a. Uh, I'm actually out of the session. It knocked me out, so I'm coming back in. Okay. Sure. <laughs> I'm assuming other people are still in the session. Yeah. So that might explain the difference in time. Basically. Well, yeah, it's a little bit of a fuzzy data set because, again, we know that not all the users are in central time, um, and so you can't exactly tell. But I think the moral of the story, for me at least, is that you know it, it is used across a broad swath of the day and night, um, exactly. you know, mm -hmm. indicating that students do take advantage of that access, um, you know, uh, at times that are most convenient for them to learn, and that's really what I think the, the key message is there. Great. So uh, another uh, sort of data point, if you will, about scalability uh, comes from the University of Technology, Sydney, um, and they uh, deliver all of their labs for some of their engineering students in a remote access format. Uh, so these are uh, both on-campus students uh, as well as remote students, but primarily on-campus students. And you can see this is their remote lab. Uh, Kind of have a room, and they, you can see that they just have copy after copy of the same lab here with this green uh, beam that they use to do some uh, engineering uh, labs on, with the webcam sort of sticking out there on those on those uh, pipes. Um, 
and uh, and that's how they deliver the labs. They just make multiple copies of it so that the you know the the length of the queue for any one of those doesn't get too long. In this case, actually, uh, they allow students to log on in real time and control it. So that way, they you know you can support multiple simultaneous users all logging on at the same time. But um, it's a nice uh, evidence point that there is you know universities are actually deploying this at scale and using it as the primary means of delivering laboratory instruction. So I know that there's been some questions about the effectiveness of, of remote labs. So let's talk for a little bit now about um, you know the evidence that we've been able to collect about their effectiveness, um, and uh, and I can share what we've learned about that as well. So uh, in 2009, we did a uh, a study where we looked at uh, pre-post learning gains, which is a you know fairly traditional way of evaluating uh, learning, and this was with a group of uh, uh, well, it was about a thousand students, but uh, uh, the data set was 594 that we actually analyzed here. Um, and overall, uh, the students gained about 15 percentage points uh, pre to post, uh, very high statistical significance, and a, and a very decent effect size, almost a full standard deviation, 0.8. And that assessment was actually broke, uh, made up of two parts: uh, a sort of a content learning, you know, did they learn? Information about radioactivity and uh, the Geiger counter and whatnot, um, and also uh, another section on uh, process learning. If I can get this thing to go away here. All right. Um, and so, if you break that out, you can see that yes, in fact, uh, on the content, uh, very, very uh, strong learning gains uh, over one standard deviation effect size there, and. Um, uh, process a little bit less, but all still very significant. And by process, I mean just sort of, you know, the uh, process of uh, scientific investigation and the uh, experimental design, um, which are more general, not tied to the specific content of Geiger counters or radioactivity. So, you know, we were very pleased uh, and encouraged that, uh, in, you know, in fact, uh, students did learn a significant amount uh, pre to post over this roughly uh, five day uh, activity, uh, and these were primarily high school students. Uh, interestingly, in a different study that was done here uh, in the laboratory setting uh, with undergraduates using the same exact uh, materials, um, students also in the remote lab uh, condition uh, versus say an identical simulation condition, not only did they learn more, but they actually remembered it better uh, a week later. Uh, when they came back in for a follow-up test, and so that was also encouraging. You know, uh, as educators, we want obviously our students to learn, but we also want them to learn in ways that um, that that information, that content is is retained. And obviously, one week isn't uh, you know isn't a huge amount of uh, long-term uh, retention, but still a lot more than cramming for a test, uh, you know, and forgetting it the next day. So um, uh, I think that's another. You know, exciting uh, piece of evidence. This came from uh, an undergraduate thesis uh, that uh, one of our students, Michael Downing, did last year, which was uh, kind of a nice, uh, nice piece of work as well. So uh, back to the study that, that we had done earlier, um, we wanted to break down the data a little bit and get some more insight into exactly, you know, what was the nature of the student improvement and. Um, and did they learn? And one of the nice things about remote labs is all of the students' uh, experimental designs are uh, recorded on in our database because they're using our website. So we're able to go and look at it. And in fact, we did see that students uh, who took advantage of the ability of a remote lab to do your experimental run more than one time, which is often all you get a chance to do in a face-to-face -face lab, did in fact improve pretty significantly uh, in their experimental design. Uh, and the quality of their research questions that they typed in, which we scored uh, with uh, uh, three different raters, um, and all of them were, you know, statistically significant, uh, you know, improvement uh, as you go from that first run to the second run uh, of of the lab. So, good evidence there that allowing students the ability to run the lab multiple times actually pays off in terms of their ability to get better at doing experimental design, which of course. Shouldn't shock us because you know you should be able to get better at anything if you practice it, and this just shows you that if you give students ability to practice doing experimental design, that they will in fact get better at it. 
Um, Do we have a question? Yeah. Um, and I think a piece of it was the practice. So any ideas as to what explains what is going on regarding the improved results? How did you measure content and process by survey, or did you also do interviews? Um, so on this uh, this data set here, which I'm gathering was the where the question came from, we administered the same uh, uh, test, uh, which was um, multiple choice and uh, you know fill in the blank kind of a test, uh, uh, both before and after the unit. So we did not do uh, we did not do interviews, but we just used the data coming off of the test. Suzanne, does that answer your question? Um, yes. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Suzanne Michael. I'm part of the Rutgers evaluation team, and so this is really fascinating and extremely helpful because I'd never seen this before. Um, and I'm looking forward to going to the NASLO lab um, in the three weeks um, out in Colorado. But um, my question in terms of your trying to find out results, your, the pre and the post is about knowledge or about experience? And how do you deal with the issue of you know, initial anxiety, the learning curve um, in terms of approaching something because people come to their class with very different levels of uh, comfort or familiarity with any kind of online or even computer. So have you, is that part of what you're measuring or are you only measuring kind of the knowledge base? Yeah, well, we, we weren't, in this particular study that, that we're looking at here, we were really focused on learning outcomes. Um, before we even got to that point, we did a lot of uh, usability studies with students around um, designing the interface. And, you know, I think we did a pretty good job because, it, you know, it's pretty clean and easy to use. Um, and that was really our goal because we didn't want that to be a hang up. Um, so this is purely looking at, um, you know, uh, scientific content learning, uh, con conceptual learning, but also kind of learning about um, uh, experimental design, what makes for good data that are independent of the specific uh, lab. So one of the questions, for example, that came out of the purple box that you see on the right side was we gave um, students a hypothetical scenario, like a word problem, with uh, two different uh, studies of a weight loss drug. Uh, and one had, uh, I don't remember the exact wording, but one of them had you know, a, a very small number of subjects but, but had a you know, really impressive result about the weight loss drugs. The other one had many, many more subjects and found no results, you know, uh, you know, no significant results. And so we asked them uh, both before and after we had the same question, you know, which results would you find more compelling and why? And sure enough, once they had the ability to go through our lab and understand why getting more data points and more samples actually helps you, they begin to understand why that, uh, how to interpret that study. So it was more of a critical consumer of scientific study question as well, which is I think more general than just a, you know, do you know about radiation? That okay. You? Thank you. That's very helpful. And there was another question. Uh, was there a control group who did not use the remote lab? In this case, there was no uh, control group. Um, that, uh, but I'll talk in a minute about uh, a comparison that we did between simulations and remote labs um, that I think will be interesting. But no, there was no, there was no control because that would mean actually having kids either just read about a lab, which I don't think is a fair comparison, um, or actually use a Geiger counter and some radioactive strontium in real life, which I'm pretty sure we would not get the parents to sign consent for. Yeah, I guess that would be true. <laughs> All right, thank you, Kimi. Um, it, just one other thing in response to the previous question. Um, we don't, I don't have it up on a slide here, but we did segment this data um, by uh, kind of student ability. We looked at some of their um, uh, grade point averages. And one of the things that we found that I think is most exciting uh, to your earlier question about students that come in with different range of ability is that we saw the largest gains in the bottom half of the class. Um, you know, so the top half of the class are pretty good students and they would probably uh, learn a lot no matter what we threw at them. 
But we found that the bottom half of the class students, at least by GPA, which is sort of a proxy for that, um, actually gain the most uh, from this experience, which I think, again, argues for the benefits of that personalized, more individual experience where weaker students don't have to feel intimidated by the stronger students in terms of uh, interacting with the lab. So I, uh, I think that speaks to your earlier question and was certainly something that we were very happy to see. Thank you. That's that's really terrific. Yeah, I, yeah I, I keep thinking I should put that on the slide here, but I keep forgetting. To use it. I I really think that is an important finding, and it also I mean I think the um, the novelty in a way may also be something that's really important for students to then kind of attend and do the work because it's something new, and it's also probably in some ways very culturally syntonic for them versus coming into a lab that is a face to face which is all kind of strange. They're they're kind of doing something that even if they haven't been taught how to do this particular thing um, online, um, many of them are much more savvy <laughs> on computers and all that. But anyway, um, but thank you. That was very helpful. Yeah, no, I, I, I very much agree with that. That certainly, you know, one of the things that us old fogies often think about, you know, and you hear a lot of arguments from uh, faculty members is, oh well, you know, it's uh, you know, it's always better to be in the lab and you know, hands on, and it's it's never the same. But I think to your point, you know, this younger generation um, it isn't really put off by the idea of you know doing Skype video conferencing or you know texting their friends or interacting with things online. That's sort of the normal way to do it, and so um, they don't really feel like uh, they're removed from the experience because it's online. Um, and so we'll have a little bit of evidence later to share about that um, piece as well. Um, a couple more things here, just to kind of you know keep this conversation going. So one of the things that we did is uh, teachers were able to either assign this lab in class or allow the students to do it at home as homework. And so um, we we looked at the different uh, usage of it, and in the first uh, row here. We took the, you know, it was roughly about half and half. A little bit more did it out of class, but you know, uh, the students who did it in class um, were not as likely to produce really good um, parameters for their experiments as the students who were doing it out of class. Um, and you can see the comparison there again because I think we, what we think here happened is that. They just didn't have as many times to run the lab and learn from their experience in class because they were still constrained by the class period, as opposed to the students using it out of class that were able to be more flexible about their access time. So again, I think that that argues for one of the benefits of remote labs is giving students that access uh, is something that they actually take advantage of, and if given the opportunity, will in fact. Um, you know, uh, do a better job because they can um, use it more time. So another way to look at this is um, the lab assignment uh, in this particular thing asked the students to do the lab twice. So then we looked at the data and we said, well, what about students? You know, were any students doing it more than twice? Because that wasn't required by the assignment. Any students who did it three or more times were doing it purely on a voluntary basis relative to the teacher's assignment. And sure enough, almost three times as many students out of class, 12 percent versus uh, four, about 4.6 percent, um, did the lab three or more times, which again was purely voluntary. Um, and uh, sure enough, you know that was a, a, a very statistically significant result, which again argues that. Um, giving students access out of those time constraints of the lab um, would open up the possibility that they would in fact engage with this experience more than they were asked to do uh, by the assignment. And I think as educators that's exactly the kind of thing that we all hope for uh, that our students will do. And, and sure enough we found some really good evidence that in fact that was, uh, that was happening. So let's move on to this other study that we did that compared remote labs to simulations because that's another question that we get a lot of times uh, since more people I think are familiar with simulations uh, in an online science delivery than remote labs. Excuse me, before we move on I have another question from the previous Absolutely. Um, did these students, the 12% score significantly higher on the post test? 
You know, I don't have that data um, segmented out. That's a really good question. Um, I would think that if you look at this data table here, you know, when we see the improvement, I mean, obviously you're not going to keep growing at that rate. It'll taper off. But I think that, you know, my answer would be, well, certainly we see evidence that students who do it multiple times do better. And so I would think that the students here um, out of class would, you know, in fact, if they did it three times or more, would continue to do better um, overall um, on the assessments. But I don't have that data broken up. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question, though. So um, I'm just, this is kind of a complicated experiment. This is one from a, a PhD dissertation that was done last year and um, uh, some of the experiments that led up to it. But some of the highlights, basically, that we found, we, we ran the Geiger counter lab that you saw um, in two conditions. One, uh, as you saw, with a remote lab, and another one with exactly the same interface on the same exact website, except that when you submitted your experiment, uh, you got data back from a simulator, not from the remote lab. And you did not get a chance to see the webcam view of it either. That's basically the difference. And so we found that students who did a remote lab, and this was in our laboratories here at Northwestern, not in a classroom environment. So this is much more of a controlled laboratory setting not a realistic setting, um, were more likely to feel as though they did a real experiment. So they liked that the lab used real instruments that they could actually control. So in terms of how they perceived the experience, they felt like it was more real. Uh, very few students who did the remote lab would want to do a simulation. We asked them, you know, after they finished, if they would want to do it again in a simulation versus a remote lab. And the majority in both conditions would prefer the remote lab um, but more, but very few um, who did the remote lab would want to go and do a simulation instead of it. Um, those students who did a remote lab would not want to run a simulation multiple times like the previous data set that we looked at, but those who ran a simulation would run, want to run remote labs multiple times. So again, it's a little confusing when we keep switching back and forth, but I think the takeaway here is that a remote lab does seem to encourage or want to make students run the, ex the experiment over and over again, which is exactly the kind of thing we want them to do from a scientific perspective in terms of how scientists really do operate and learn questions or uh, you know, uh, investigate uh, phenomena. So a few more other results that we got um, uh, from, uh, and this was published in a, in a journal. Um, we did find participants who used the remote lab wrote, wrote higher quality research questions than those in a simulation condition. Um, and we also uh, were playing around with how important the video was. Um, and the ones who did have the video, um, as opposed to just the still image of the equipment, also wrote higher quality questions um, when they were in the remote lab condition. But simulation users didn't seem to have this difference. So we, we were able to find that if at all possible, having a, a video, a webcam video of the remote uh, equipment seems to be an important uh, piece of the user interface. So uh, the implications that I take away from this um, are that the remote lab users seemed a lot more invested in the actual experiment. They crafted better research questions. You know, they considered uh, you know, the impact of human error uh, or other sources of variability in their data and they wanted to run their experiment uh, multiple times. All the kinds of things that uh, we would want to instill in students from uh, learning about uh, scientific investigations and scientific process. Um, and the, finally, the remote, use, uh, remote users, remote lab users who watched the video felt the most engaged with the task. So the video was an important piece of the pie there. Um, so that, that kind of summarizes the results that we found. Um, let me stop and see if there's any questions on our results before I wrap up because we're just about at the end of the hour here. Are there any questions from the audience? I do not see anything in the chat, but if you would want to take the microphone, please do so. And we can also do a little Q&A right at the end. I just want to be respectful of everybody's time um, as well. All right, so let me just wrap up to talk a, a little bit about where we're heading now with some of our work. Um, you know, we'd like to make uh, it easier uh, for students to access 
uh, a, a whole range of different labs via these sort of standardized interfaces. So it would be nice if uh, it was a consistent experience for students from device to device as you saw today. Um, we realize that we need better tools for instructors. And so we're, right now we're working on a new tool set that allows uh, instructors to uh, get better visibility, sort of like what you have in a Blackboard um, uh, in terms of which students uh, are where and how much work they've completed. So we're trying to do a better job allowing instructors to track student lab work uh, using remote labs. Um, we are also trying to build out some learning analytics and assessments that uh, allow for better personalization of the, of the learning experience for students and also to provide instructors with ideas of which students might need more assistance so that they can jump in and, and help those students as well. Uh, again, we're trying to replicate the experience of wandering around your, your physical lab and keeping an eye on your students. And we know you can't do that in a remote experience. And so we're trying to replace that with more powerful online tools for instructors. Um, we've begun to move uh, our interfaces so that they can be used on uh, uh, mobile phones and tablets. Uh, and that's already begun to be working, although we're not quite ready to release it yet. But Pretty soon you'll be able to run these labs on your uh, your iPhone or your Android phone or um, you know an iPad or, or other device like that as well, which I think is important because that's really the way the students get online access a lot uh, these days as well. Um, we're also starting to look at what it would mean to support laboratory science MOOCs, although that's still very uh, much in the early phase um, as well. So those are some of the areas that we're looking at as well. So just again to wrap up, we're right about at the end of our hour. Um, I think we've shown today that remote labs do support effective student learning um, and that some of our uh, evidence is that they have unique affordances not shared by other online tools uh, like simulations for you know, creating an authentic online experience that's grounded in reality and uh, they help students engage in scientific inquiry when either the necessary lab equipment is not locally available or that you're engaging with online and distance students. Um, and we know that from other research that participating in uh, real research uh, leads students to gain confidence and feel much more like a scientist. So that taken together, I think those are very encouraging pieces of evidence from the literature and from our work. Um, because remote labs feel authentic and are easy for students to access, uh, we believe and I believe that their implementation could have a very positive effect uh, on student experiences and outcomes for STEM education broadly. So with that, um, you know, just I think to wrap up the, the benefits that we've been talking about, uh, you know, they're scalable, although, you know, we still have a lot more work ahead to, to, to make it even more so. Um, the remote labs allow laboratory interaction to be tailored much more specifically to the student learning goals uh, or your learning goals as a faculty member uh, and the audience that you're serving. Um, they allow, uh, when implemented appropriately, a much more personalized learning experience for students, providing better and more access, as we saw, providing potentially better feedback for the students in terms of their individual learning, and also uh, uh, individual pacing, allowing students to go through it at their own pace as many times as they want. And we saw evidence that that was a, a very positive uh, effect on their learning outcomes. So thank you for your time today and for your questions. Uh, if there's any more, um, we can certainly uh, entertain those. And I uh, want to acknowledge um, uh, the source of our funding at the National Science Foundation and Hewlett Packard as well as University of Queensland for providing aspects to the remote labs. So thank you. Um, two quick questions. Yeah. Uh, one was, is there a reference sheet that you could provide to us that uh, detail or just gives us a list of the studies that you have done? Uh, because people would like to access some of that research if it were possible. So that was the first question. The second question was um, one of the people that are participating today has tried to get access to the iLab to play with it and has not been able to get that access. Do you have any suggestions or could I get a list together of people that would like to go in and, and experiment a little bit with what you have? and? and set some user accounts up? So the first answer to the first question is uh, no, there's no reference list, um, although um, I'm guessing uh, the slides will be available and the references are at the bottom of each of the slides. 
Okay. Um, so you, you can certainly get them from there. I would point you to um, the uh, Distance Education Journal, um, which has a fairly extensive uh, literature review in there um, as well. Um, so that would be a good place uh, to start, I think. Um, and um, certainly, if people have questions, that you know, they can email me specifically, and I can try to point you in, in some certain directions. Um, the answer to the second question is, um, I'm not sure what happened to that uh, Geiger counter. We tried to check it today, and it um, uh, at least the camera seemed to be offline. Um, but um, you can certainly, um, you know, email the uh, uh, email address that's on our site for uh, questions or assistance. But in general, it should be available, and you're welcome to uh, log on and play around with it as well. If you um, are thinking about putting a, a larger group of students through it, um, please do be in touch because we can set up a, a special user group that will allow us to track. Um, you know how many users um, are are going to the device specifically, but um, you, you know you should be able to get at it. You know I will say that one of the tricky things about uh, you know using remote labs from around the world is that you don't always control uh, you know how well they're kept up or if they go offline you don't always notice it right away. So um, you do have to kind of uh, you know be a little bit patient with um, you know. Equipment coming up, going on and offline at various points in time. But in general, you should be able to get online and use that. Um, and uh, if not, uh, certainly let us know via the uh, email address there. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Timmy, for joining us today and giving us this fantastic webinar on remote web based labs. I think it was very informative. We really appreciate uh, your speaking today. And as I mentioned, uh, this is recorded. So I will have a link to the recording probably later today, and I will circulate that out via the listserv. So that said, um, we're going to close the session. And again, thanks so much, everyone, for taking the time to attend as well. And if you do not know how to exit Eliminate Live, there is an X in the right-hand corner of the software. You would click that, and that will end the session. Thanks so much. I still have three people on the session, so would you please exit the session so I can close the software out? I would appreciate it. Thanks so much.